Hi, welcome to Bookie, which unlocked big ideas from world bestsellers in audio, text, and mind map. Please download Bookie at Apple Store or Google Play with more features, get your free mind snack now. Today we will unlock Pride and Prejudice, a masterpiece from the celebrated British novelist Jane Austen. In 2003, a poll conducted by the British Broadcasting Corporation produced a shortlist of the nation's 100 best-loved novels. Pride and Prejudice was ranked second. The novel was written over 200 years ago, at the end of the 18th century. Yet, today, it remains cherished by readers from all over the world. The American literary critic Edmund Wilson once said, There have been several revolutions of taste during the last century, and a quarter of English literature, and through them all perhaps only two reputations have never been affected by the shifts of fashion, Shakespeare's and Jane Austen's. In fact, the prominence of this enduring literary classic has dimmed little over time, notwithstanding the relatively narrow scope of its narrative. American author and thinker Ralph Waldo Emerson has criticized Austen's novels in general for being limited to themes of marriage and family. Charlotte Bronte, the British novelist who wrote Jane Eyre, which we have unlocked for you in a previous bookie, made a similar comment on the stifling domesticity of Austen's world, saying, I should hardly like to live with her ladies and gentlemen in their elegant but confined houses. Indeed, in her lifetime Austen wrote six novels and all of them, without exception, focus on marriage and family. Pride and Prejudice, the novel we are interpreting today, follows this pattern, telling of the romances and marital experiences of four young couples. Austen had a flair for evoking such seemingly trivial topics in her writing. In her own words, she put it like this, three or four families in a country village is the very thing to work on. On one occasion, someone suggested to her that she should try dabbling in other literary genres, but she tactfully turned down this suggestion, saying, no, I must keep to my own style and go on in my own way. Austen's preference to write about marriage and family is inseparable from her personal experience. She was born in Parsonage House in the town of Steventon in the English county of Hampshire, the seat of an ancient family. Her father was the local rector, and the family were financially secure. She remained unmarried throughout, living with her parents and sisters for the greater part of the 41 years of her life. Most of her days revolved around household chores, visiting family and friends, participating in balls, watching plays, and playing cards. These occupations were similar to the experiences engaged in by the women in her novels. And her day-to-day -day cares also parallel the concerns of the women she wrote about, fashionable clothes, neighborly gossip, interesting friends and handsome gentlemen. Therefore, her novels consist of mundane and seemingly trivial details of everyday life. Her plots unfold, being spurred by seemingly ordinary events such as dances, social visits over tea, family dinners, games of cards, as well as countless other episodes of idle chatter and leisurely walks. Yet the restricted scope of her material did not impede Austen's vision. Perhaps Austen's own perspectives are best represented by something said by Elizabeth Bennet, the female protagonist in Pride and Prejudice. When her love interest Darcy tells her, the country can in general supply but few subjects for such a study. In a country neighborhood you move in a very confined and unvarying society. Elizabeth replies, but people themselves alter so much, that there is something new to be observed in them forever. Even if there were limitations to the types of characters that Austen wrote about, she could through them always reveal aspects of life's theatricality. She wrote of the universal and multiple facets of human nature. We will now share our interpretation of the novel in three parts. We will find out how Austen's simple story of marriage and family has stood the test of time and continued to touch the hearts of so many, right up until the present day. In part one, we will provide you with a summary of the novel's plot. In part two, we will interpret for you the way Jane Austen has conveyed various perspectives on marriage in the novel. In part three, we will share several key aspects of the novel's comedy with you. What sort of views might Austen have held about the institution of marriage in the early 19th century when her narrative is set? The novel essentially deals with stories of four marriages uniting four young couples. By analyzing the different attitudes that Austen conveys towards these liaisons, we can summarize some of her personal perspectives on love and matrimony. Now, let us gain a detailed understanding of how Austen regarded these four different affairs. 
Charlotte and Colin's marriage was undoubtedly the most practical, one of them desired a marriage partner, the other needed a guarantee of material comfort, and hence, an equable match was formed straight away. Charlotte's father was a nobleman, and from a very early age, she received a first-class education. She lacked neither intelligence nor knowledge. However, what she lacked was what her, her parents had not prepared for her, a dowry. Her appearance was not regarded to be the most beautiful. These combined factors meant that although she had been on the lookout for matrimonial opportunities, she remained single till she was 27. If she continued as a spinster, she would be nothing but a burden to her family. Hence, when Charlotte heard that Collins was looking for a marriage partner, and Elizabeth had turned him down, she immediately recognized that this was her opportunity. She purposefully reeled Collins in, engaging him in conversation. Their chat eventually led to courtship. In just two days, she had successfully obtained Collins' proposal of marriage. She was surprised. She did not expect that Collins would rush headlong into this affair and be so swift and decisive in changing the target of his love interests. Although everything happened suddenly, Charlotte was genuinely satisfied with Collins as a partner. Of course, what gave her cause for satisfaction was not his physical appearance or talent or personality, but his assets, his status, and social networks. Ultimately, she settled for herself an honorable provision for well-educated young women of small fortune, the pleasantest preservative from want. As the story tells, Charlotte's considerations around who would make a suitable marriage partner were entirely based on practical advantages. Austin was not promoting this kind of financially secure marriage agreement. She adopted a sardonic writing style to describe Colin and his desperate hunt for a partner. Austin highlights how ridiculous he is making two overtures of marriage in only three days. Using Elizabeth's character as her mouthpiece Austin mocks the ludicrousness of such marriages. For instance, Austin reports on how satisfactory Elizabeth found the Collins' abode when she went over to visit. Her purpose is to suggest that only Collins' material circumstances mattered. Elizabeth is full of compliments towards Charlotte before adding a caveat, a particular line that conveys Elizabeth's speculation about Charlotte's true intentions, when Mr. Collins could be forgotten, there was really a great air of comfort throughout. The line hints that the honorable provision that Charlotte secures is merely comfortable financially for her. Collins, her husband, has no place in it. That line conveys an authentic portrait of this particular brand of loveless freedom from financial worries in a nutshell. While Charlotte's marriage is entirely based on material considerations, Lydia went completely the other way. She is solely concerned with satisfying her desire, valuing only Wickham's handsome physique. Lydia is naive, with a total disregard for consequences. This, added to Mrs. Bennett's excessive indulgence, caused her to behave brazenly. Lydia's marriage is impractical, made for adoration alone. In everyone's eyes, Lydia and Wickham's union was terribly unwise. Yet Lydia herself did not think so. After she returned home as a married woman, she continued to boast, believing that she had found the most perfect romantic match. Even though Wickham behaved deplorably, and her elopement was an unspeakable scandal, Lydia never doubted that they were truly in love. It didn't concern her that he encouraged her to run away with him to escape his debts or that bringing her along was just a convenience, so he would have a woman's companionship for his journey. Lydia thought the elopement was fun and exciting. She did not feel that she did anything disgraceful. She reasoned that this was an incredibly interesting way to marry. At the end of the novel, Austin does not neglect to update readers on Lydia and Wickham's marital circumstances. They were financially stretched and the romance between them had also fizzled out as Wickham's affection for her soon sunk into indifference. If Wickham had not continued to need Darcy's assistance, it seems reasonable to assume he would most likely have abandoned Lydia long ago. From the tragic way the marriage played out, we can understand that Austin felt that any marriage, solely based on the pursuit of pleasure, a match intended only to fulfill desire, would not be a good marriage. The marriages Austin believed to be ideal were typically none other than those of Bingley and Jane and Darcy and Elizabeth. In both of these unions, the loving couples were compatible in personality and well-matched in education and upbringing. They held a mutual admiration for one another. And these factors allowed them to develop deep and genuine bonds of affection. 
Furthermore, their marriages were built upon foundations bolstered with money. Money provides additional strength. Through these two couples, Austin articulates her perspectives on marriage. A loveless marriage is not at all a marriage, but a marriage without a decent financial foundation will lack security. Only marriages with both love and sound finances can be considered truly ideal. When writing of Elizabeth's romantic experiences, Austin's purpose is to highlight Elizabeth's persistence in love. Her rejection of Collins and of Darcy's first marriage proposal, as well as her subsequent refusal to abide by Lady de Borg's unreasonable request that she refutes rumors of her impending marriage, all stem from her determination not to entertain a loveless match. She will never give up on love. Austin frequently expressed herself from Elizabeth's perspective. This device allowed Elizabeth to articulate her views on other marriages in the novel to the reader. Elizabeth's own voice further reveals her resolute belief in love. In fact, in Austen's era, Elizabeth's determined pursuit of love was revolutionary. The majority of women had little hope of anything that neared such an ideal in marriage at a time when class compatibility was the standard way that defined a woman's opportunities. With these social marriage conventions, women had little choice. It didn't matter if they liked their potential suitors or not. Hence, the perspectives Austin expressed through Elizabeth's persona were progressive in their own right. More meticulous readers would notice no lack of utopian ideals in Pride and Prejudice. Not only are the male protagonists handsome and wealthy, but the female protagonists are witty and beautiful. These exemplary people also happen to fall in love with one another and overcome all the obstacles and the paths that lead to perfect married lives. They finally live happily ever after, just like in fairy tales. For these reasons, some readers criticize Austen's novels for being unrealistic. Perhaps the utopian ideals portrayed in the novel are necessary. They serve to illuminate, by comparison, just how difficult such a marriage, both materially secure and constantly nourished by love, is to find in reality. Austen's personal experiences testify to this. She was involved in several relationships throughout her life, yet none bore any fruit. When she was just over 20 years of age, she met Thomas, the nephew of a neighbor. He had recently graduated from Trinity College in Dublin and was preparing to go to London to further his studies in law. The college term had yet to begin, and he went to pay a visit to his uncle's house, where he became acquainted with Austin. The two hit it off immediately. Austin came to believe that Thomas would soon propose to her. However, when Thomas's and found out about their relationship, she was worried that Austin would be a liability for her nephew. She promptly sent Thomas away. He quickly had a change of heart and married another young woman from a wealthy family. Several years passed before another young man proposed to Austin. Although he was the heir to a tremendous family fortune, Austin felt no love towards him. She ended their liaison rejecting him. Austin's sister Cassandra similarly had several fruitless relationships. The sisters remained unmarried throughout their lives. It is thus apparent that, although Austin held the most progressive ideas about marriage, it was impossible for her to exercise her principles in reality. At the time, most marriages were ultimately the outcome of practical considerations not in accordance with paradigms of love and spiritual compatibility. Today we are just sharing limited content. To unlock more key insights of world-class bestseller please download our app. Just search for Bookie at Apple Store or Google Play, get your free mind snack now.